I can't tell you how much I've been looking forward to this conversation on when your boss sucks. And I have to say that I'm going to try to be pretty serious during this conversation, but I think that this is a topic that when we get some distance from the situation is great for telling stories and, and we can't look back on often without smiling, but when we're in the middle of it, it is not a smiling matter. So we're going to try to stay somewhere in that serious realm. But I just want to tell you that I think we've all been there. I know I've been there. I worked for a time for a boss who, I don't know if you remember the Austin Powers movies, but there was a character named Dr. Evil, and Dr. Evil would frequently say, why am I surrounded by idiots? And this was our boss. I mean, she had she had the sense that she knew what was what, and everybody else was of subpar intelligence, and she didn't mind letting us know. And in fact, she fired a number of people who were extraordinary in their competence and in their performance. And because she fired people who were so competent, when they began to sue the organization, that's when the organization got serious about looking into what this person was about and eventually she lost her she lost her job but boy did she leave a, a chain of wreckage behind her and thereafter i always referred to her as she whose name cannot be spoken and i'm thinking you probably have your own stories we're going to get into some stories we also want to spend a good bit of time talking about what you can do what you can do within your organization to try to gain fairness, regain fairness, to try to salvage a positive work experience and to move along in your career without being encumbered by this sort of pain. Work is challenging enough. There's so many pressures on us. To have this kind of a situation as well is such an undue and, and really terrible situation to endure. We're also gonna talk about what you can do when when the system isn't working well. Maybe the chain of command is not responding, is not paying attention. Maybe human resources is not really up to the job or, or functioning in the way that they ought to be as honest, honest brokers in the organization. We have two wonderful guests with us who are gonna who are gonna join me in this conversation and share their great depth of knowledge and experience and let me tell you a little bit about them. Randy Kratz is a senior account manager and employee assistance program consultant and counselor at FEI Behavioral Health. He holds a BA in social work and an MS in counseling psychology. He's a licensed clinical social worker. He's a professional counselor. He's licensed as a professional counselor in the state of Wisconsin. He has worked as both a psychotherapist and a psychotherapy supervisor in outpatient and hospital settings for more than 15 years. He's been a workplace consultant for over 22 years. He helps employers and employees with traumatic stress, with conflict management, with organizational change, with substance abuse, with issues of work-life balance and all kinds of other challenges that are relevant to the resiliency of people in the organizations in which we work. And he is known for his storytelling ability, which you'll see in our conversation. He presents regularly at conferences and facilitates workshops across the United States. Also with us is Mike McCafferty. Mike is an MSW, he holds his master's in social work and he is credentialed as a professional in human resources. He has his PHR for short. He's a coach and consultant who partners with leaders and teams and individuals, motivating them to move from being disengaged to engaged and from being immersed in their difficulties and the problem to creating solutions together. Since receiving his master's degree from the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee in 1997, he's been providing consultation and training and counseling and EAP services to organizations across the spectrum of size and industry and has been working with a diverse background that he brings, I should say, to his work, a diverse background that includes experience in healthcare and human resources and construction. 
He has a long track record and personal commitment to helping organizations create and forward the conditions for change. These two gentlemen are with FEI Behavioral Health, and their website is www.feinet.com. Welcome, gentlemen, to Work Life Confidential. Thank you, and thanks very much. Great to have you here. And let me ask you, Mike, let me start with you. Why does almost everybody have a boss from hell story? What is going on here? Well, that's a that's a great question, Ken. I think the the sad truth is that there are, there are a lot of bad bosses out there, and I think there are a lot of reasons for that. Some in some cases, I think those bad bosses or what people experience as bad bosses are are completely oblivious. They're just people who maybe have never had it brought to their attention that they're making things difficult or unmanageable for their employees. But in other cases, I think you have some individuals who gravitate towards positions of power and authority who do so maybe for less than uh, noble reasons. And uh, maybe it's that power that draws them in. So I, I think there are a lot of reasons. Uh, so as many as, as many reasons as there are bad bosses, probably. I, I would agree. And I have in front of me a book that I think everybody deserves to read. It's called The Sociopath Next Door. And it's written by Martha Stout, S-T-O-U-T. And she, one of the excerpts, which is on the cover, is one in 25 ordinary Americans secretly has no conscience and can do anything at all without feeling guilty. And I agree that there are some people, some of those one in 25, who gravitate toward quote unquote leadership roles. And unfortunately, they tend to rise within many work organizations. So Randy, Mike said that sometimes people who are in this situation, they, they're just oblivious. They're oblivious to the fact that maybe they're, they're absent and they're not supportive, or maybe they're doing things that are actually extremely hurtful to the people who they have responsibility for leading. What, what do you think can be done about that? So they're completely clueless who should be doing something about it? Why aren't they doing something about it? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think, you know, to answer the first part first, why is that I believe they have something that's a value added to the organization. So that's why they often, you know, management above them often look the other way because they bring something valuable. This might be why they were promoted. So oftentimes they get promoted out of their skill set. And what I mean by that is, is that their ability to, to demonstrate self-awareness or other awareness or what we might call emotional intelligence is pretty limited. And so they are just pretty much focused on tasks, on focused on uh, what they see as the, uh, valuable and oftentimes the people management side isn't there. And, and so what you can do about that is, is you know, again, that's a, that's a tough one, but I think that being able to, as upper management, understand that, that uh, how they take a look at how those, the subordinates, how the people that report to that boss, how they're responding, whether there's factions, forming below that person, whether there's a lot of uh, under the table kind of communication. So you want to be aware of those things. And, you know, and, you know, again, back to my original kind of answer is that there's ways that you can improve somebody's emotional intelligence. I think there are ways to, you know, if you can hold somebody accountable to become other aware and to look at those things that helps. Okay. Well, I, I think that, there, there's so much in, in what you're saying, and it reminds me of a conversation that I have had with a colleague over the course of a few exchanges of emails, 
And he wrote to me and he said, I'm beginning to work with an organization and what they're seeing is that they have people who are strong performers and the only way to move them up in the organization is to give them people management roles. So they do that. They do that. And then they find that they have the kinds of problems that we're talking about. And I have to tell you, one of the things I said to my colleague is, well, this is this is one of the most common issues that any leadership or organizational consultant deals with, any HR professional deals with. I was also struck with how clearly they stated it, that they caught that they're doing it. It's that whole idea of we promote people to the level of their lack of skill or to put it more crassly to the point of their incompetence or even the Peter principle, I've heard it called. And it just seems to happen over and over and over again. And 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 then there's this whole group of people who are reporting to this individual who maybe never even wanted to be in a role where they were expected to be the role model for the the formal role model for the group and the person who motivates others and communicates the mission of the organization to their group and who provides constructive and supportive guidance balanced with accountability those are all skills and it seems to me that there 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 are so many organizations that do exactly what you're talking about that they just sort of slot people in and then I want to and then they and then they don't watch they don't watch the climate they don't watch the culture in that group from the highest levels and so they don't really have any idea of the pulse of what's happening as you were describing well, so I think there's what? that mm-hmm. I was just going to say and that just and, and one of the reasons they don't see it or notice it is because that very employee, that boss, is very effective at managing up. Yep. So yep. they provide the kind of um, story to their boss that they want their boss to know. So it is, it, it, it kind of, um, you know, is, is reinforcing, right? They, 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 uh, they're able to maintain their status by the information they pass on above them. So Right, so, and, and if I could jump in here, I would mm-hmm. say, referring back to my initial comments, the, the type of, if you will, um, the, the type of bad boss who fits into that sociopathic category you were, you were referring to, Ken, is definitely the kind that will have a much greater ability to promote themselves and to manage up. They'll manage expectations of the people evaluating their performance because they're very conscious of performance and uh, and image. And you're not going to see that kind of toxic behavior nearly as much in, in a boss who's uh, oblivious to their to their negative impact. So I think it's it's important to it's important to differentiate the two because there are very different survival and and success strategies for working under those different types of boss. Yeah, I I agree, and I think that differentiation that you're talking about, Mike, is so important. And that the sociopathic one, often, I think the simple way to describe them is as bullies, that yeah. they are people who use their power abusively, intentionally repeatedly i've heard the definition of bullying as somebody who or the the practice of bullying is repeated intentional misuse of one's power to denigrate another person to put them down to make them feel small to hurt them and Mm -hmm. when bully when bullying is happening the bully as you mentioned, is exquisitely sensitive and attuned to the dynamics of power. They know exactly who they can do it in front of and who they can't do it in front of. They know exactly how to represent themselves up the chain of command and sideways to the extent that they need to present a positive, just the the best the best possible self-image that they can, which can be 
absolutely completely different than what they present when they are in the sphere of their control with the person or the team who they supervise and nobody else is there. So exactly. And then, as you said, if it's more just obliviousness, then you, when that person is challenged, they're going to respond in a way that's very different. They're going to respond in a way that's going to probably have some mortification, <laughs> like they want to be doing the right thing, but they are... But might not know how. Sure. They might not know how, and they certainly don't want to be hurting people. And so this is, a, this is important because... I, I have often said that the way a person responds when we challenge them, when we bring it to their attention, what we've learned tells us an enormous amount, both about the way that they're, the way that they are making decisions and also their willingness to change, their willingness to change. There's a huge amount, there's a huge amount we can learn from whether or not a person takes responsibility, is willing to apologize and make themselves vulnerable in a way that shows the strength that they're willing to grow and change. So we are going to come to a break here. And when we come back, we'll talk some about what you were saying, Mike, like how do you approach these people? What can be done? But also we're going to focus on what if you're living with this kind of situation. We'll be back in just a minute. We're talking about the painful experience of working for a boss who is either abusive or absent or in one way or another, extraordinarily difficult to work for. And I wanna give you just a, a few examples. So I consulted once on a situation in which there was a boss who was very much playing favorites all the time. There were those who she loved and there were those who she essentially made scapegoats. And there were people in the group who would play to her sensibilities and her sensibilities were things like her belief that she had a beautiful body and they would say things to, she would say things to them that would ask for compliments. For example, she would come into a meeting and she would sit at the table and she would have a very low cut blouse on and she would ask the male members of the group who were in her favor, what do you think? And they would say, the girls look great today and referring to her breasts and others who were present would feel like this was grossly inappropriate. There was all kinds of encouragement to share personal drama that was going on in their lives outside work. And there were people who were entertained by this, who felt great about it because they felt like their workplace was a family where the leader was a mother figure who loved them. And there were others who were out of favor who, and this punctuated that difference. And of course, if you were out of favor, it was a terrible situation for you. But the bottom line was, it was just hard to get work done. And this was exposed only when the scene, this was a senior leader, when the senior leader started messing with the money, which is often the way these things unfold. And then the spotlight came and then the rescue came and there was a great deal of work after this person was exited to help the team look at look at what they'd been through to reconstitute to come to terms with the trauma really that they had been engaged in and they had struggled with so i'll ask i'll ask you randy if you can just talk a little bit perhaps about maybe a similar circumstance or maybe a different circumstance and and how you've gone about being of some assistance sure so what you know, we've talked a bit about bullying, um, and it brings to mind for me a situation I was recently dealing with is when does the concept of micromanagement become or turn into bullying too, right? And and we I had this situation where um, a director of an organization was promoted there because of how talented he was at the technical side of things, of the operational side of of the job that they did from an engineering standpoint and of course he gets promoted then he has people that report to him and then he he begins to 
you know, he, he, he transitioned up the, the chain of command, and so people backfilled and replaced the jobs he had. So he was beginning to see that, that they were doing the work differently than he would have done it or than he did it. So he started to micromanage, and he started getting frustrated with them doing the work a little differently. And that ended up um, causing a few of those workers to file a harassment claim. And that's how it came to the attention of us at the EAP, right, that after they HR uh, did due diligence and they went through and it was not, it did not rise to the level of harassment, but there was obviously issues. And, and so uh, what became part of what we did there is to interview everybody, have a sense of how they experienced that, and, and including the director. And what was interesting is, we found out a real disconnect um, from the director and, and, and also that he was a very isolated, lonely man in his life. The only thing he had in his life was the job. So he had lost his mother recently. He was never uh, married. Uh, he didn't have any pets at home. His best friend um, uh, got cancer and died suddenly. So he... And, and that, in tune, um, that kind of correlated with his micromanagement sort of moving into bullying behavior. And so what the organization did then is be able to provide him with leadership development coaching that also included the capacity to um, sort of take a look at his life from a, a personal standpoint, too, and to help him understand the impact of that on the workplace and that became a really um, useful process and ironically and I was I was working with him and ironically he he decided that he made so much of his life outside of work that he decided to retire early and leave and that's how that ended up and so it's like you're working and providing resources to help develop him and then he realizes he wants more out of life than this anyway. And, well, and a, so that's how that one went. That's a that's a great story. And it shows that sometimes the work that we do doesn't necessarily end up with the person staying and contributing to the organization, but they leave and they have a a more fulfilled life. I would imagine that that man would have wonderful things to say about his workplace in in yes. having left with the way that he did. And the other thing that strikes me about that story is that that's one of those situations, as Mike was talking about, where the person doesn't intend to be hurtful, doesn't intend to make life difficult for others, but isn't able to observe himself accurately and make adjustments, doesn't have the kind of emotional intelligence that was mentioned earlier. And that's that's a wonderful, that's a wonderful outcome. And it's also striking to me that the organization responded as promptly as they did, because it it has often been my observation that as we talked about a bit earlier, it this kind of thing can go on and on, particularly if if the leader is able to get production out of their group, however they're doing it, or if they're able to present themselves in a, in a glowing light up the chain of command. That's a great story. Mike, do you have sto a story that you'd like to share as well? Well, b before that, just a just a comment on what you were saying, Ken. That's that's a, an interesting observation. Uh, two two observations. A that I think that story of Randy's is a great example of of a bad boss who isn't a bad person. Mm -hmm. They're just going through a bad time in their life. And uh, I think uh, the other comment I was going to make was that you know I think sometimes sometimes we we do get uh, a little bit. Uh, blinded by results. So if uh, senior level management is seeing results coming from a department, if they're not actively looking the other way, they might be really readily accepting of, of a bad manager's or a, 
or a, a tyrannical manager's explanation and, and claiming credit for those results. And sometimes it's kind of hard to, to see through that smoke screen because um, oftentimes I have found, I'm thinking of a couple of situations I've been involved with where the manager was toxic, uh, really, really um, into a shaming and blaming style of management, um, constantly changing uh, expectations for people, yeah. giving poor guidance as to how to meet those expectations, and, and personalizing uh, criticisms of the employees. It was a very stressful environment for people to be working in, and yet they achieved terrific results. Mm -hmm. Not because of the style of the manager, but because they were all really talented individuals who had in their team uh, a strong bond between them and a strong commitment to each other. They had had a series of uh, poor managers, people who I think were legitimately diagnosable, uh, and, and I don't say that lightly. Mm -hmm. um, but they nevertheless produced really solid results quarter after quarter after quarter. And a lot of it had to do with that strong sense of commitment to each other that they had almost almost like uh, survivors of a combat situation will sometimes develop intensely strong and permanent bonds. So it, it, it was really interesting in, in that particular case that I'm thinking of to, to see that despite the, the toxicity of that manager, the, the employees were still able to thrive from, um, from a perspective of their output. Now, on a personal level, and this is why I, I got involved with them from an EAP sense, it was because multiple employees were having stress-related complaints, um, which were starting to show up as physical illnesses, physical ailments. Some of them had... Uh, started to develop relationship problems and uh, some substance abuse issues as well. So the results were fine. And unfortunately, the organization didn't, didn't really think to look past that level, uh, maybe skip a level and, and talk to people. So how are things doing? You know, how, how are things going with your boss? It's 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 very interesting the stuff you're saying. I I've seen the same kind of pattern, and when I see that kind of of team, I always ask myself, can you imagine what they'd be able to do if they had positive facilitative leadership, if they weren't yeah. being stressed the way they are? And as you and you describe that so well, that what's happening is the workplace is eroding their health. And eventually, it will erode their performance as well. It's probably limiting their performance to some extent, because if they had a different kind of leadership, they might reach an even higher level. But it really points to the idea, the reality that the workplace, the culture, and the way I see it, your immediate supervisor is your culture. They embody the culture of the team, that that culture is either helping people be more healthy or it is challenging their health. It's not neutral. And there are all kinds of correlates to individual health for the organization that that result ultimately in productivity. The that the the health of the organization through its individuals correlates to the business results. And of course, it also correlates to costs, things like the incidence of disability, the duration of disability, the incidence of going to the emergency room. All these kinds of things are, to some extent, dependent on the culture of the group, and that culture is created and promoted largely, not entirely, as you're describing, not entirely, but largely by the leadership. The leadership has an enormous role to play. And the other observation that I'd like to emphasize in what you said is that many, when there's abuse or neglect going on in the organization, what I've seen is generally there's a systemic reason for that. It's not just that supervisor. It's, as you said, it's either the supervisor above is not watching 
and not doing those skip step conversations down into that particular supervisor's direct reports or that supervisor is in fact modeling the same kind of behavior and so it's it's cascading and one of the things i'll say to leaders when when there's this kind of trouble going on in their group because i've worked with leaders who are hesitant to make changes because the productivity is strong and what i'll say to them is you know everything that happens in your chain of command in your chain of authority reflects upon you if you let this go if you do not challenge it and by the way you're not helping the abusive or the absent supervisor by standing aside you you can only help them by getting closer and holding them accountable and providing them the supports to do their job better you are now looking weak ineffective, abusive yourself. There is no neutral ground here for you as the next level leader. And that sometimes comes as news, but it's very, very important in my experience to help the next level understand this reflects on you as much, if not more, than it reflects on the immediate supervisor. And do you want this to be the way you're perceived? I think that's a great observation. You know, you're uh, you're encouraging them to be responsible for the for the organizational culture. You know, it, even even if they don't necessarily want to um, acknowledge it, they are responsible for the actions of their direct reports. And and again, they are the role model. Mm -hmm. We all look at the person who has authority as the role model like it or not and it's just human nature for that to be the case so you also mentioned that there can be a kind of knitting together of social support within the team that will help people to to do their best work to to shine both individually and collectively sometimes at the expense of their health, or perhaps ultimately without question at the expense of their health because of the enormous stress. But that's something that we want to talk more about as well. I just, before we move there, I just want to say that I believe that if you work for somebody who is not a good leader, who is one of these bosses who sucks, it's very important for you to get some assistance if at all possible to go to the human resources organization if in fact the human resources organization in your group is known to be functional and a fair broker to go to the leader above your leader if you know that that person or you imagine that person is going to be helpful and also to perhaps make sure that you're honing your plan b your plan B being your plan for the long range, what you're going to do next, because everybody deserves to be treated with respect all the time when we're at work. We all deserve that. So if you're feeling stuck, please get some help. And that may be that you're going to get help starting with your EAP professionals or a counselor through your medical program. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes to talk about how to survive in the context of this kind of situation. Stay with us. We're talking about living with, working with a terrible boss. And I wanna spend some time now talking about how do you manage that? What can you do to take care of yourself? What can you do to advocate for yourself? What can you do if if the situation looks like it is not going to change to to do your work as you need to do your work but also look for the next role where you're going to be treated fairly and respectfully and randy why don't you start us off with some thoughts well the way you finished the segment was uh wonderfully said ken in terms of seeking help from your HR department or if you have an employee assistance program. But I, I think what I wanted to think about is that natural sense of resiliency we all have, right? So I believe that all of us have the capacity to adapt to tough situations. And, and I've seen it over the years. I've seen employees 
gravitate to like-minded people. I've seen employees support each other. I've seen in some sort of irreverent and profane ways, I've seen them actually because in, a, in, in sort of an interesting way, they have a common enemy. And in that common enemy might be their boss or, or the inability of their boss to give them motivation or give them the kind of um, people-related things that they need from a support standpoint so they get it from each other. And then there's that powerful sense of peer support. And they, they look out for each other. They, um, you know, they, they, you know, in ways that um, they wouldn't have discovered previously. So one of the things I would encourage people to do is to not badmouth their boss, but to look at how to help each other be successful, realizing we all need that. And from an employer standpoint, you know, you talked about it earlier, Ken, that is oftentimes employers will promote somebody into a people management position, and that's not their skill set. They're not good at that, but that's what's there. And so then I would encourage employers to take a look at other ways to think about that person. Can they be a consultant to a specific task rather than actually manage or supervise people? Is there the capacity to make those changes? and find ways to uh, manage the people in that aspect of things in a little different way and realize that peer support has become, in, in many ways, a valuable resource tool of employee assistance programs. I know that that's one of the things we are, we are teaching and training is helping uh, employee work groups be able to provide support for each other and to take care of things in, in their own in their own way as peers. It, it's interesting what you said to me. Well, it's all interesting, but something really stands out, and that is the idea of evaluating people who are in leadership roles to see if they really ought to be, and yep. to realize that they may be able to create contribute much more effectively if they return to an individual contributor function. And there, I have heard of at least one forward-thinking organization that has set out to do that, to evaluate those who are in people leadership positions to see where are we with this? Or do we really have the right people in these roles? And it's such an important, it's such an important thing to ask because that principle of rising to the level of leadership without necessarily even wanting to, certainly not having the aptitude for it, is very, very common. Mike, let me ask you this question. When should somebody who is in this kind of situation, how should they decide whether they're going to go to human resources or to the next level of management, presuming that their organization is large enough, and large enough that it has these functions? When should they go and when should they not go? Mm, boy, that's a that's a uh, it's a simple question with a complicated answer, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to depend depend very much on um, factors outside of that job, factors uh, inside. Um, it's going to depend on the structure. I'll, I'll I'll probably start with that. You said at the uh, the end of our last segment, if you will that uh, if you have a human resource department that is a credible and legitimate resource, it, if it is actually a source of assistance and guidance, um, that I think can be uh, an argument in favor of approaching them for assistance. Now, I think unfortunately we all have had the experience of and are familiar with human resource departments which are very clearly uh, in the corner of an employer and and thinking about nothing but protecting that employer from um, you know liability and protecting uh, you know trying to limit losses and things like that, which again would be uh, something that they could be looking at in a situation like this. But for the time being, we'll just leave it at for the individual to decide whether or not to approach them. What's their experience been with that HR team or that HR department? Do do they answer questions when asked? Do they seem like they're an advocate for employees? 
do they keep confidences when it is appropriate for them to do so? Can they be trusted? In other words, trust is huge. Uh, if the other factors that I that I mentioned, you have to decide: Are you in a place where you can uh, potentially afford to not be working for a while? If you absolutely have to to decide, okay, I can't continue in this situation, and I've gone to HR, they have done nothing. In fact, it's gotten worse. Now what do I do? So uh, I've spoken with people who have. Um, and they've done the math and they've decided, okay, I, I can't leave now, but I will be eligible to retire at a certain level uh, in 18 months, and now I have to figure out what is my short-term survival strategy. Uh, so that really reverts back now more to self-care. What do I do to manage my stress? What do I do to take care of myself physically, emotionally, mentally? And uh, unfortunately for the organization, um, the employee probably isn't going to, to advertise that that's their motivation. So if the organization really isn't doing that, that due diligence to find out how people are doing, they might have employees who are in that uh, survival mode, and they're really not getting their, their discretionary effort. They're not getting their best effort. They're not getting anything besides compliance. So, so I guess to, to get back to your initial question there, there's a lot of factors that go into that. I would say you have to decide each. You have to decide that very much for yourself, depending on your own situation, uh, your family situation, your financial situation, and the availability of other options that you might have. I I I like all that you're saying, and I'm gonna emphasize something, and that is that it's my belief, and it's the way I work with people from a from a holistic appreciation of their lives to always say, look, where are you financially? Where are you in terms of your financial security and your planning? And and this is so very important to peace of mind and to the opportunity to see that you are not trapped, that you are not trapped in your current situation. And so it's very important, I think, as an expansion on that for people to have a plan, for people to to see themselves not as I'm in this job and and that's it, but I'm in this job and where does this job fit in in my longer range plan? Where do I want to go next perhaps? What skills do I want to develop? What is my long-term goal for where I want to be? In my career, because if we can, if we can be constantly working toward that next thing, and, I, and when I say working toward it, I mean having a, pr- a very clearly stated sense of what you want for your next role and where you want to be in five years from now, and having your resume up to date, building your network of connections, having some one or two people who you consider mentors, taking classes to hone your skills and develop new ones. I believe if you're doing all of those things, we're going to be able to deal with these kinds of situations because we know that this is, this is now, but it's not forever. Does that make sense? Totally. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's a really good reality check for people to, to have. I think, um, it is it is when people feel trapped that they are most vulnerable and that and that can so easily happen that can so easily happen so what are some if you could leave just a couple of thoughts with our listeners what thoughts would you like to to leave with them as we pull this conversation to a close well, I guess I would say that sometimes it's it's not feasible or you can't make a change from your workplace now. So if you realize what you have control over and what you don't. And so what I would say is when you're at work, you may not have control over much of what you do in terms of um, your boss. You know, who we work with is more like an arranged marriage, right? It's not always out of love. Right, and, and, and so basically what I would say is the areas that you do have control, what you go home to, 
um, what you do in your personal life. Make sure that that is fruitful and nourishing and builds you up so that when you go into work that your bucket full of energy is ready so you can handle those things. So, that so, so a, um, pay attention to what what you can control. I'm going to cut you off there, Brandon, yeah, no problem. in the interest of time. Pay attention and put your energy on what you can control. Mike, 30 seconds. Uh, nothing is forever. So if you have a bad boss, um, just remember that this is not the only boss you will ever have unless you decide the next step is to be your own boss. Then if you have a bad boss, it's a whole different conversation. <laughs> that's that's great. And when we are stressed to the max, when we're overloaded, we tend to feel like we are paralyzed in a moment that will be eternity. And it isn't. It isn't. So I want to thank you both very, very much for being here and sharing your knowledge and your and your experiences. I want to encourage our listeners to think about the resources that are available. And if you're lucky enough to have FEI as your EAP provider or you have another EAP provider and you are caught in this situation, please reach out for their help. It'll be a confidential conversation, assuredly. And that can be the starting place for taking stock of how you're doing, looking at your options, and deciding from there where you're going to go with this, where you're going to go next, because it's in taking some action that you're going to feel freed from some of the extremity of the pressure and the stress. You're going to see that you can do something, and that is the beginning of, of a bit of healing. So we are, we are again, privileged to have Mike Kratz and Randy, um, I'm <laughs> reversing you guys, Randy Kratz and Mike McCafferty from FEI here. Their website is www.feinet.com. Mr. Rogers said, if it's mentionable, it's manageable. And that's what we're here for. We're here to continue to break silences, talk about the important stuff that too frequently goes without being said and find solutions together so that we can move forward with more clarity and calm and safety and good health. Join me next week where I will have Nancy Saxton Lopez, who is a dear friend of mine and my co-author on the book, The Pet Loss Companion. We are going to be talking about pet loss and healing from loss in general. I'm Ken Dolan Del Vecchio. You've been listening to Work Life Confidential. I'd like to thank our executive producer, Randall Libero, and our engineer, Josh. And thank you so much for being with us. We'll look forward to another conversation next week.